Welcome, everybody. Uh, once again, my name is Chris Stubbs, and I head up the educational gaming commons here at Penn State. Uh, so this is a piece of sort of what I do. We deal with educational games, gamification, uh, all kinds of ways to make learning a little bit more interesting. And that's sort of where my involvement in digital badges started. Uh, but it's kind of progressed beyond just the game sphere, and we'll get to that in just a, just a minute. But um, for starters, I want to say that I understand that the audience may be diverse here. So I don't know where all of you come. Uh, into digital badges from, how much everybody knows. So I'll just kind of do a little bit of everything this session, and if you have specific questions about things, we can certainly talk about that. Uh, and I guess let's, let's start. So to begin with, you know, most people are probably familiar with the, uh, the concept of badges. Can you guys see that okay? Seems a little light. Maybe we can, oh, thanks, Jason. Um, so most people are familiar with the concept of some kind of, of you know, insignia uh, that can serve as good. You get the night vision cameras going now. So, um, so mo okay, I like that. Don't nobody go to sleep. Uh, most people are, are probably pretty familiar with the idea. Do we have two buttons? <laughs> All right, that's fine. Imagine, if you will, an image of, um, so, you know, what this is, if you guys can't see it too well, uh, or a picture of, a, you know, the Girl Scout vest and uh, a general in the, uh, in the U.S. Army. Actually, I think this is Joint Chiefs of Staff. Anyway, um, the point of bringing this up is to say that we're familiar with the idea of insignia that people wear uh, to mark certain things. In the case of Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, or in the case of the military, they, they talk about certain things like status, right? things that you've done, they, they indicate rank. Uh, they are recognition for specific actions that people have, have uh, gone in and, and taken a part of. Um, but these things are generally very specific to the context in which they're deployed. So if you're a part of the military, you may understand what the red and blue and white uh, little uh, insignia means on someone's lapel. But if you're not, you probably really have no idea what that means necessarily. But I bring it up to say that the idea of, of certifying people's abilities has been going on for a long time in different contexts. So now I want to bring it back to my wheelhouse, which is sort of the gaming space. I'll take you back to the year 2005. So, uh, I, you know, at one point I remember, I've used this slide before, and I remembered like who won the Academy Award, then I think it was Crash, but I always forget. So just imagine some kind of bad pop music and a good Crash movie uh, happening in 1995. But I bring it up because at this point, Microsoft, who is the creator of the Xbox uh, gaming console, released a concept called achievements. Um, I did not actually crush my PM slushy. I'm sorry. I hope that all of you have had a chance to get that. But uh, achievements, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, are the sort of developer-created goals that were put inside of video games uh, originally to help people sort of play a little bit more than they would have otherwise done. So you play a game. Typically, you beat the game you're done with it, right? Maybe if it's a multiplayer game, you go back and play with your friends. If you really liked it, maybe you play the game again. But most of the time, it's a fairly kind of one and done experience. What achievements did were they extended the play of games because they were these sort of little goals, these Easter eggs that developers put inside games that encourage you to do new things. So it's not just beat the game, beat the game in three hours. It's not just kill the Nazis, it's kill 150 Nazis, right? They were things that were designed to push your uh, place experience a little bit further than you otherwise would have done. It was sort of a one-off, but it took off. And now we see this idea of achievements, if you could see this idea of achievements, uh, in a lot of other contexts. So Angry Birds on your iPhone, other gaming platforms. Wow, man, we got everybody coming in, welcome. So. Oh, the wrong room. Yeah, I saw that the schedule was a little misprinted, so I apologize for that. But welcome. So glad you guys are here. We're just getting warmed up. So, um, so the idea of achievements uh, permeated a lot of different uh, gaming contexts. And so this is just meant to articulate that it sort of boomed all over the place and then started to extend itself beyond the idea of just gaming. So now there are achievements in things like Foursquare, right, where you can check in more than other people and you can unlock these badges, if you will. I didn't want to break out the B word quite yet. Um, but it, it's this idea that now we're being encouraged to do things in the real world uh, that we hadn't done previously. You know, the Huffington Post offers badges for people who comment on things a certain number of times or post a certain number of times to articles. So it's this, again, this way of recognizing people. 
Uh, and in the gaming context, the goals were a little bit different than they are in sort of the, the scouts or the military. So it's about motivation, right? Providing feedback to people. This constant reinforcement of like, hey, good job. You beat the level. Hey, here's your next goal. Yes, reward. That sort of dopamine drip that everybody gets so fond of. Um, but there was also a community aspect to it too. So the uh, achievements that you could earn in gaming uh, were very social things. So whereas a Girl Scout sash might be something that you could see if you were at a Scouts meeting, your gamer profile was sort of ubiquitous. So it was always up, always online. Your friends could follow you. They could see what you're doing. And then that, in turn, led to new kinds of motivation because you'd say, oh, well, if Zach got that, I need to get that because I'm a better player than he is. And so it sort of pushed people uh, in informally competitive ways. But, you know, even as a gamer, I understand that most people don't appreciate the things that go on in games, or worse, I have kind of a negative connotation of it. So this idea of achievements, though it did manage to spread, was never something that was fully appreciated, I think, by the broader world, uh, if you will. Though that was my maybe plug for games. So go play games. Uh, they're educational, is the other part. Until 2011. Uh, and that is where Mozilla, the maker of Firefox, as most of you probably know, uh, decided to reinvestigate this concept in a slightly different context. So Mozilla uh, hires a lot of developers from the open source community. And for those of you at this conference, I'm sure everybody knows what that means. Um, but they realized that there was a problem with the traditional credentials that they were looking at for people. So these were people who sometimes might be self-taught. These were people who have learned from peers. These are people from, uh, who have sort of just cut their teeth doing things. They may not have the computer science degree from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, that you might find on a traditional resume. Their CV may be a lot stranger uh, than most, or they don't have a CV. Um, and they realized that they needed a credential that could help them identify people who were really talented, but didn't necessarily fit into the traditional way that we were uh, recognizing one's accomplishments. And so they instituted this idea of the open badge. So what the badge is, with credit to Kyle Bowen for this image, uh, is very similar in, in idea to the achievement that we talked about, to the military insignia or the Girl Scout badge, uh, in that there is some knowledge of what it is. There's a basic description of it. There are criteria that need to be met uh, in order to earn a badge. There's issues, maybe it ties back to standards. But there's one, well, I guess there are two really big differences. Uh, first of all is the transparency associated with this. So all of this information, the name, the description, the issuer, when it was issued, is all fully available to anyone who wants to look at it, and it's just online. Just click it, and you can see what, it's, uh, what it took to get that. But the big piece is evidence, and that's one of the things that is missing from a lot of these other structures, where you earned an achievement in a game, or you earned a, a Girl Scout badge. At some point, there was a reason why that was issued to you. But in terms of badges, what makes them so special and what makes them so unique is that that evidence is stored along with the badge. So to give you kind of an idea, of what this might look like, right? Again, if you could see what this might look like. Um, we all have things on our resumes today, right? We all have certain skills, and they're especially uh, in, in relationship to things like soft skills, right? I say I'm great at giving public speeches to people. I'm a great communicator. I'm a fantastic team player. Uh, or I build circuits or some hard skill, right? A lot of times it's very difficult to, sh to prove what that means to someone, right? We all say it because it's very highly valued by employers, by advisors, by whoever's uh, judging your professional or academic merits. But there isn't a lot of way to prove what it means. With a badge, if I say that I'm a good public speaker, there's now a link to some form of evidence of that. So a conference presentation that was recorded might be evidence of my public speaking badge. A video of me online. Uh, a copy of the presentation itself, evaluations of the people who were in this room. All of these things could contribute uh, or be the evidence of my claim that I'm a good public speaker. And all of this is validated by someone else. And that's essentially how badges work uh, in a nutshell. So that's sort of the primer for anyone who's not familiar with badges. But as with any good conference presentation, I felt like I should give you the reason why you should care, why we cared, and why we decided to build this sort of thing. And I have done it in a gripping three-part saga, as I like to say. I was hoping that there was going to be, you know, I wanted sort of the classical music to play with each one of these. That got really complicated, so I dropped it. So just imagine something really sort of foofy and British uh, as I go through this. So uh, with all love to any of my British friends out there, it's just, I'm jealous of the accent. Somebody with a real speaking badge would have won the badge. I know. This is, this is why. I, I'm like the bronze level. I'm, 
first tier. Um, so why did we explore badges, uh, specifically here at Penn State? There are a lot of people who are looking into this space, but there's a couple of reasons that we started to do it. The first reason is a lack of transparency. Was that all right? Anyone? Uh, yeah. All right, 50%. Thanks, Sherwin. Um, so this is what we, as a university, typically offer people uh, in terms of the kinds of uh, credentials and recognition that we provide. Uh, the top part, for those of you who are not in academia, is kind of the academic transcript. The bottom part is obviously the degree uh, that's issued by Penn State. The problem with both is that they don't have a whole lot of granularity associated with them. So you can look at something like the academic transcript, and you can see that a student took MGNT341 HUM Resource Management. Now you can probably figure out that that's a management course that deals with human resource management. And in this case, this student got an A in it, right, or an A minus. Good for them. What does that actually mean? We have no idea outside of this particular university, Penn State, what that means. So if you are from another university, if you are a potential employer, you can get access to the transcript, but you don't know what that actually means. So you get an A minus, what is it you didn't know in that course? It might be that you didn't know how to deal with complaints in an office. That was a module in the course. That's kind of important if you're hiring someone to be a human resource manager, but you have no idea because the transcript doesn't get granular uh, for people. Similarly with the degree, right? You get a degree, a Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science in something, but if you're not affiliated with the university, you don't have a full context of what that means necessarily. You rely a lot on reputation, but it doesn't tell you what specific skills someone has. So this is a problem, theoretically, right? Or maybe not, because the university's been around for a long time, we accept degrees, we accept transcripts, uh, Stubbs is making up problems, right, that don't exist. Except, now there are MOOCs. Right? And MOOCs are fully transparent because everything about them is open. You can sign in. You can look at all of the assignments that were given. You can look at all the course material that's offered. You can tell exactly what someone is doing. You can't see all their assignments necessarily uh, that they've completed, but you can get a much better sense of what they learned and what they didn't learn as compared to our transcript, which doesn't give you all of that access. In fact, we delete everyone's stuff after six months or so after they've gone through a course. Um, so we don't preserve all these records. And this now becomes a threat. If you have sort of these open opportunities for learning that are, by definition, open and can be viewed, all it takes is for an employer to say, you know what, I'm okay with what you learned about uh, operations management from Wharton, right? I don't need you to go and spend $2,000 on a course at Penn State University. This is good enough for what we need you to do. Now we have a problem as a university. So now we move on to chapter two of our epic saga, and that is the peer pressure component, right? So admittedly, peer pressure is a very bad reason, usually, to do things, but we do have Jason Fish in the room, and he is from Purdue University, who has already started using badges. I jumped ahead in my slides, but I felt like now was the time to highlight his presence in the room. Um, so Blackboard, course management system, very, very popular. Uh, I think it's the leading uh, CMS for educational institutions. They have partnered with Mozilla to start building badges into the newest version uh, of their system. And from what I, we're actually running a pilot here at Penn State starting this summer. And from what I understand, badges are actually included in the CMS from that, from that side. What that means now is that we as a university might start seeing students come to us already having had badges in different contexts, different schools, their K through 12 experience. Maybe they got badges as a part of an internship. You know, other people use this system, and so it starts to socialize this idea uh, of badges as a part of the educational experience. Uh, Arnie Duncan, Secretary of Education, recently came out and talked about the importance of badges, uh, specifically for starting to credential things at a more granular level. You don't have to read all that. Plus, it's a little washed out, so you probably can't. He said badges are good. We should be thinking about them more critically. Northern Arizona University uh, has recently switched to a competency-based report uh, or competency-based model for their general education curriculum. Competencies and badges, are competency-based learning is a concept in education uh, that essentially deals with the kinds of things that you can do, discrete skills that you can prove. Uh, they have recently moved to this sort of model. Competencies and badges are very, very similar uh, in a lot of ways. Sometimes it's two sides of the same coin. Uh, but you might say, okay, well, Northern Arizona, that's a very different kind of school, maybe it has a very different kind of mission, but we have other schools here within the Big Ten, the aforementioned Purdue University. Shout out again to my man Fish. 
uh, as well as Indiana University, who I just found out like 10 minutes ago uh, will be, I don't know if this is public, can I say that? No, never mind. You didn't hear anything from me. Um, is interested in this idea of using badges uh, for the curriculum. We have a question? Uh, yeah, really quick historical. Oh, sorry, we need a microphone for a question. <clears throat> Hello? Uh, really quick historically. So I even went here, I graduated four years ago. I can't recall, uh, you know, you, you mentioned like the lack of transparency in our transcripts here at Penn State. Did, has Penn State historically ever offered the opportunity to list out your key learning objectives per course at a historical record? For instance, like an employer wanting to go back and say, hey, I saw a course ABC on your transcript, just like you just showed on the screen. Did we ever offer that level of detail? either publicly or on like on a request basis, yeah. like that would list some of those common competencies per course? Yeah, not that I am aware of. I mean, I know departments maintain that sort of thing, and from my understanding, a lot of the, the burden would essentially have fallen to the student. So you could create an e-portfolio, for example, and articulate the sort of specific learning objectives, but it was never, you wanna see exactly what a Penn State degree means? Here it is. Uh, now we do do that for things like accreditation, but I don't think that's just freely available to anyone who's interested in it. Great question. Um, so there are other universities in our sort of peer group, the Big Ten, the CIC, uh, that are getting interested in this idea of using badges. Um, but ultimately it also comes down to the kinds of things that we as a university want to do. And for some of you here, this is probably old news. For those of you who are not familiar with Penn State, uh, there was recently an announcement from our senior level administration that we are going to be pushing our world campus, which is our online course offerings, to grow from about 15,000 now to 45,000 over the next 10 years or so. Uh, so that is a significant increase in the amount of students. And what that means is it's going to require a slightly different approach uh, to the way that we start to issue academic credentials. And we've seen this approach already start to happen in things like University of Wisconsin's Flex Degree, uh, which is essentially catered toward people uh, who struggle with the idea of spending a ton of money at a university uh, and committing four years of their life consistently to it. So Wisconsin has made it easier for people to take more bite-sized chunks. This is what badges can help to do. They can break down the credit into something smaller than that, discrete skills uh, that you can come away with that have been validated by something that have evidence associated with them that you can potentially use. So what are we doing about it? Uh, we decided to build a badge platform. We are not the only ones who have done that. I mentioned uh, Purdue earlier and, and the Passport system, which is certainly more mature than our own. Uh, but one of the things about working at a university like this one is that data uh, is very, very important to people, preserving that uh, and maintaining control over it. And I'd say control not in the big brother way, but in sort of data security perspective. Uh, and so for that and a couple of other reasons, we decided we were going to build our own platform. Uh, and I may come back to do a little demo uh, later on if we have some time. Uh, but we decided to build a platform uh, with a lot of thanks to, uh, so Sherwin Saul is in the audience, Nick Rossi, uh, the members of TLT Studio uh, put this together and did a great job. And we essentially wanted to put together a, a proof of concept for people. This was a new idea uh, in our environment. A lot of people weren't familiar with what the idea of a badge was. We didn't know, as a development team, how people were going to implement this. Is this something that people wanted to use within a class? Did they want to use it from sort of a departmental perspective? Did people want to create learning objectives that they could be very transparent about? Uh, so we didn't really know all the ways that uh, we were going to use a system like this. So we started asking, uh, and we, uh, we created what we called a shareholder or a stakeholder group, which was about 30 or so people from around the university, faculty, administrators, staff members, all who had sort of interest in badges or needs that we thought badges might be able to address. And the goal in putting this group together was we essentially talked through the design of the experience as we were going through it. And we said, all right, so you, faculty member A, want to use this in a class. You, Dean B, you're interested in doing this for a program level. And it gave us a lot of information about the kinds of things uh, that people were going to need to do with the system before we built it. So we really put together a whole list of feature sets, case studies on possible use cases uh, before we started building anything. Uh, the system itself is built in Ruby. Um, the reason for part of that was because of the gem structure that's associated with Ruby. So for those of you who are not Ruby developers, like myself, gems, thanks to Sherwin for informing me, uh, are these sort of prepackaged code uh, elements that you can include uh, in things and make it a lot easier to sort of ramp something up quickly 
uh, without the need for a ton of development resources, which was important because our system was developed with one person, essentially. Uh, it was created using the, uh, the Agile framework, and so with this stakeholder group, we essentially did little two-week design uh, cycles. At the end of every two weeks, we would have added a new feature, new process, uh, new component to the system. Then we would review with the stakeholders. They'd get a chance to get their hands on the system and say, well, what do you think? Is this kind of what you meant when you said you needed it to do this? Is this in line with the way that you were planning on using it? And we got to refine the process and refine the process and refine the process. Uh, I will say for anyone who has not done something like this, uh, it can be a stressful experience, uh, but I think it's, it ultimately leads to a better system that's more in line with what your end users want. Uh, and that was, a, I think, a great decision on our part to, to really try and include people, both in terms of making our system better, uh, but also increasing adoption, because people really got to help build a system that they wanted to use. Um, one of the questions that comes up very, very quickly, if anyone is interested in creating their own badging system out there, is about data storage. Uh, and it is a question that we are in the middle of addressing right now because as you can imagine, if there is evidence associated with a badge, so if you're maintaining links to someone's presentation uh, or a Word document of a project management uh, skill that they, they uh, completed, that's a lot of data. And it's something that as a university we have not historically done. Uh, so we started to have conversations with uh, some of our long-term archiving groups on campus about how it, and what it would mean to preserve data potentially forever for the life of this badge. Uh, so it's a big deal. It's a big scope to do that sort of thing. There are other places that you can go uh, to, so to store your data, but for us as a university that wanted to maintain access uh, to that data and make sure that it was secure by our standards, it was something that we have to consider and we're still looking into it. Uh, we also started with Heroku, which is everyone familiar with what that is? I see some heads nodding. Uh, for those who don't uh, know, Heroku is a service sort of like Amazon Web Services that you can, uh, it can support your code, allow you to scale it up uh, without the need for hosting, though we have since moved it back to Penn State Hosted Services. But as a way to spin it up, we started with Heroku. This is probably completely invisible to you guys. Can you guys see this? All right. Kind of? All right. Bonus. So this is uh, the basic workflow of what it, what it takes to create a badge. If you're familiar with the badge process, this is probably going to be very obvious to you, uh, and I apologize for being redundant, but for the folks who are new to badges, uh, we begin over here with our half-egg-shaped badge creator, who decides that they want to create a badge, in this case, in rocket surgery, right? So that means that they have to decide what the criteria are for the badge, they have to come up with the description, they have to determine what kind of evidence they want submitted with that badge. Once they're done, uh, they can sort of save it as a draft for a while. When they're finished, it goes into a large badge library, so the archive of all the badges that have been created. At that point, we move on to this stage, where it can either be pushed or pulled, and by that I mean that uh, either the earner can seek out badges in a specific area. So they can say, you know, I want badges that deal with leadership, and they can search for any badges associated with that, or it can be pushed uh, to a potential earner. So you as a teacher of a course could say, I want all of my students to earn these three badges as a part of COM 110 or something like that. The earner then moves on to submit the evidence associated with that badge, so our sort of newspaper looking thing here. Uh, at that point, it, that evidence gets set to someone to approve it. They can either say, yay, this is good, or nay, it needs to go back. The user will get some feedback that's submitted by the reviewer. They get the chance to revise and resubmit. If the evidence is approved, now we move over to here. We've got the happy half eggshell person uh, who has now earned their badge uh, in rocket surgery. And at that point, they get the choice of what to do with it. So by default, for student privacy reasons, all of the badges that are created and, and awarded in our system are private first. The reason that we made that distinction uh, or the decision is because there is student work associated with certain badges. And so we didn't buy want to, by default, to sort of violate Student uh, Information Privacy Act, that would have been a bad thing for us. Uh, and so badges are default, by default private. They get the choice of what they want to make public and what they don't. Uh, and at that point, they can push it out, uh, either on our system or share it out to kind of the central badge repository that is the Mozilla backpack. Do people know what that is? Should I explain that? Uh, we got that kind of like full, I got cake in my belly look. So. All right, if anyone has any questions about Mozilla, we can talk about that too. Um, so this is just to give a, oh wow, that's not gonna work at all. Uh, badges have steps, 
you can decide what kind of uh, criteria you want to put. There's no real design constraints at this point. And, and part of what the exciting slash terrifying thing is about digital badges is this nothing is set in stone. So right now, our system lets you create as many steps to a badge as possible, or as possible, as you'd like there to be. Uh, there's no optimum number that we have figured out yet, though we're working with our instructional design team now to try and figure out what those kinds of things are, what the best practices are in badge making. Uh, so to give you a, a sense of kind of some of the case studies uh, that are happening now in terms of different uses for badges that are going on, I bring this up so there's a lot more people at Penn State that are interested in badges. Uh, but was there, was that a question? What was, oh. Yes. Oh, okay. Fire away. Um, I was just wondering who is it that uh, is creating the badges? Who's the happy half eggshell over here? Is it a professor or is it right. a director of a program? Who's deciding I need a yeah. badge about X? Yeah, so there is no one answer to that question, uh, I would say. We have folks that are interested in creating badges at sort of the departmental level. We have units like sort of our career services unit, like the university libraries who are uh, departments uh, that are interested in creating badges. Individual faculty members, uh, groups like the College of IST and College of Liberal Arts are interested in issuing badges at sort of the college level uh, now, but there aren't processes and procedures by which we know how to do that sort of thing yet. Uh, so our system can do it, but as a university, we haven't figured out quite what that means yet. Uh, so where does a badge go? Is that a part of your transcript? And so we're working with groups like our registrar's office to sort of figure that out. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of everybody. In fact, even students have the ability to create badges. Uh, and we did that intentionally because we wanted students to be able to create badges for things that don't always get recognized, like uh, organization, student organizational leadership, right? is not something that you get a certificate for. It doesn't always appear on your transcript, but it could be really valuable. Um, for those who are not affiliated with Penn State, we have a, a, an event every year called THON. Uh, it's a dance marathon that's used to raise money for pediatric cancer. Uh, it's the largest um, student philanthropy organization, I think, in the world as far as the money that's raised. Um, and the undertaking is enormous as far as the logistics, the effort that goes in, the organizational requirements. But if you don't know what THON is, even putting that on your resume doesn't necessarily mean anything to someone. So that's another possible use case of a way to articulate a skill that's not really covered uh, in the traditional uh, sense. But some of the other examples of different use cases for this, and so on the left is the group that's interested in it, and on the right is the reason that they're interested in doing it. And I think this is also important to share, not just to give you a sense of kind of how people are using badges, but also to give you a sense that there are a lot of different reasons why people use badges. And there isn't one size fits all, just as there's not necessarily firm design principles on how to make a badge, there's a lot of reasons why people make badges. And I think that's very, very important to consider if you're interested in doing badges in some context on your own. So, you know, our career services group, Student Affairs, they're interested in improving the marketability of our students, right? They want our students to be successful, to get good jobs, to interview well, to be able to showcase their skills well. They want to include badges as, as a part of the student's e-portfolio experience. So that's a very sort of student-centered approach. Uh, the College of Liberal Arts, interested in sort of similar ideas, but they also want to give students almost like a roadmap of here badges as the possibilities of things that we uh, appreciate, the things that we think that you should value as a student here at Penn State. Uh, we have an institute called Schreier uh, that deals with faculty development, right? They want to issue badges to help teach faculty how to teach online. Uh, Office of Sustainability, they're interested in program visibility, so they want people to earn badges so that other people can see their badges and in turn sort of spark this motivated group uh, herd mentality. Um, we have a business school that's interested in using badges to help speed along their accreditation process. Uh, the University Libraries wants to help teach digital literacy, literacy skills and then credential those, so another idea of something that hasn't been traditionally met with the transcript, with the degree. Uh, so all of these are different possible use cases, and there's no one right or wrong answer. Um, one of the things that comes up with all of this is that, in case the past couple of comments haven't made it clear, there's a lot of unanswered questions that go along with badges, right? We have yet to figure out how they fit into the university landscape. We have yet to figure out, does this mean the end of grades? You know, a colleague of ours who's been integral in this, Kyle Peck from the College of Education, uh, believes that sort of the future is that badges will eventually replace grades. They will replace the degree. 
Maybe that will happen. Maybe they are another option. Maybe they're more akin to certificates. Maybe there's something different entirely. Uh, you know, how big is a badge? Who should be the person issuing it? Is it the individual? Is it the department? Is it both? Um, there's a whole lot of questions that, that get into this idea of badges that haven't, that candidly haven't been answered yet. So if you're interested in this space, now's a good time to jump in because we're always looking for folks to help us uh, explore these kinds of questions and, and help to answer them. But we can share a few lessons that we've learned even so far. So we're still in sort of what we would describe as our pilot phase. Uh, our goal is to have a full sort of deployment for fall of this year. But having said that, if there's anyone out there that's interested in using the system, uh, Certainly at Penn State, and if you're from outside of Penn State, we'll see if we can work something out. Um, so one of the things that we didn't know going into this is what did students think about badges, right? We sort of had this idea that students love technology. The students, and they play the games, and the, they'll love it, right? So that was Bill Cosby, right? It was, it was a little rough. I haven't <laughs> had any. Yeah, sorry. I apologize. The British was even worse. I'm not doing so well with the accents. Anyway. Um, we didn't know what students were going to think about this idea, right? Is this a motivating thing to them? Do they care? Do they think it's cheesy? We didn't really know what to expect from the student perspective. Uh, it turns out students like two things a lot. They like efficiency. So for example, in the case of the university library, they would see students that would come in and have to do an introductory research session for all of their freshman level courses, right? So the same student might end up in four of these uh, research sessions and they would tell their professor, I just did this for my English class. Do I really have to do it for the comm class? And the professor says, of course you did. You go. Um, so one of the things that a badge can do, so a certified, validated uh, credential that has evidence tagged with it, it can sort of reduce those inefficiencies. Um, students love that. So they get really excited about that idea. They also like the idea of a system that can make it easier for them to share their accomplishments. So we have a very robust, uh, very successful e-portfolio system here at Penn State, but it still falls on the student, sort of like the question earlier, to articulate the things that matter to them, the things that they think employers are going to want to see. We view the badges as a component of that. So badges are now the evidence. The e-portfolio can become the place where you describe the context and give it meaning. Uh, they like that too, because students like to get great jobs, they like to show well, uh, they like to sh have their skills displayed in a way that, that makes sense, and badges make it easier to do. So they like those two things a lot. There are still some questions about how it integrates, and those are questions that, frankly, we haven't answered yet, uh, that give them pause, because what students don't like is learning another new system. Uh, but we've tried to design this in such a way that it's as easy as possible to use. Employers generally sort of do the eyebrow raise uh, when we talk to them about badges. This is, excuse me, a relatively new concept. But it's starting to take hold uh, in a number of different areas. I think uh, manufacturing actually just released something relatively recently that talked about they're interested in using digital badges to help certify skills. So things like welding, uh, for example, might earn a badge, which makes sense, right? It's not a full degree program exactly, but it is a very important skill. There should be some evidence associated with it. It makes sense. It fills a void. Um, but uh, a colleague of ours, Emily Rimland, has done some research uh, that talks about employers are interested in badges for the right kind of student. So they figured out how to vet students, right? They know how to find a good student based on the GPA, based on what they know of the program. Uh, they don't know how to get the right student, the perfect student. And as all of you probably know, hiring is a very expensive process. So if you can do something to get a little bit of added value and to distinguish between students A, B, and C, as you've narrowed them down already, as to who's going to be the perfect fit, they like the idea that badges can provide a little bit of extra information. Uh, and they're not willing to sort through an infinite amount. So the research that Emily did said they'll give about five badges. So you're really talking about the cream, creme de la creme uh, of badges. But you have to earn them to be able to show those five. Um, good evidence is something that comes up a lot. This is sort of an instructional design problem, but it's also a badge problem because bad evidence means bad badges. Uh, and if the badges are useless, if I give everyone in the audience today a I give good hugs badge, right, and you have to come and give me a hug to get this badge, that's great. It's also probably going to devalue badges as a whole because now other people will look at this and say, well, this is not rigorous. This is not compelling. This provides no value unless you were looking for a hug. Uh, but it, it, it hurts the system as a whole to have badges like that. And so helping to, to show people and to talk with people uh, about what makes good evidence, and we don't always know the answer to that, 
what is good evidence for knowing Socratic method, right? We're still sort of exploring that. Uh, but it's raised some very interesting questions for some of our faculty partners as they have to go back and think, what is it that's really important to me? And these are things that have been done in order to create a class, but not always things that are done at a level that is this granular. Uh, so ultimately, it provides value. Peer assessment, right? It badges scale beyond a certain point. Do you want peers associating each other? As a university, are we interested in that? Maybe, maybe not. But if you're not part of the university, if you are part of sort of a, a corporate environment, maybe it's okay to have people get peer reviewed uh, in order to earn certain kinds of professional development badges, for example. Um, I mentioned earlier a lot of the different use cases, and, and just as kind of a piece of advice, I would say know your use case whenever you start using badges. And you might have multiple, but it's very, very important because if you don't know the use case, and specifically if you don't know who you're creating a badge for, uh, you can create some very awkward situations that are not going to work for you. There are some badges in the system that we know are for students because these are badges that are going to help them get a job, for example, or help them uh, express their, uh, their, their experiences to an academic advisor or a graduate school uh, counselor or something like that. There are some badges in our system that are really for faculty members, for administrators, for managers. Uh, to go through and assess their staff, their students. Those are very different use cases, and it's important that the badges are designed appropriately. Um, badges get used a lot. I mentioned the you know, Boy and Girl Scout badges. Uh, and because of that, there's sometimes some baggage associated with it. So you know, competency-based learning is used a lot. Micro-credentialing uh, is another term that's very popular, and it sounds very fancy, so people really like to say, oh, a micro-credential. Well, that's <laughs> goulet, fantastic. Uh, so don't get caught up too much in the word badge, uh, because there are some people who don't like it, uh, and frankly, will judge it before you ever get a chance to articulate some of the value that's associated with it. People can't make graphics, and I'm one of those people, so I should have known this to begin with, but uh, it helps to provide people with as, as many resources as you can as far as creating uh, graphics to go into the system, because though the graphic is sort of the, the icing on top of the steak, which is not a good analogy at all. <laughs> that's, that's, I was going for the meat, right? Because the badge is, the, yeah. It's one of those days, I think. Um, anyway, the, the graphic is not what's important, but it is what people see first. And so one of the mistakes we made in the first iteration of our system was that you could, you could create a badge, but you had to put the graphic in right as you were creating it. And so people would agonize over what this was. And this could have been like a doctoral degree badge, right? Like the rigor is there and this is vetted and we have a committee to do this kind of thing. But they're like, I can't figure out how to make a graphic. I, just, I won't do it. I won't make the badge because they were so stressed out about that experience. It does get to people. Uh, and so provide avenues for people to create high quality graphics if you can. Uh, Jason's shaking his head. So uh, it sounds like they've gone through that too. So um, yeah, it's, it's a hurdle for people. Uh, and then let people experiment. We went through a lot of different discussions about do we close off the creation process to certain people? Do you have to take a test in order to be cr able to create a badge? And one of the things that we learned by just opening it up and letting people make badges is that it creates new use cases that we weren't expecting, that we hadn't anticipated. Uh, and that is valuable to us because it lets us further refine the system to, to suit the needs of the people that are using it. And that's one of the most important things that you can do. So, with that, I will stop talking, and I'm happy to answer questions or revise points. We can look at the system if you guys would like to see it. I forget what time this session ends. All right, 10 minutes, perfect timing. So, for those of you at Penn State, uh, you can jump into the digital badges at Penn State Yammer Group if this is something that interests you, uh, or you can email me if you're not from Penn State. Also, this is a great place to email me, um, and we can certainly talk more. Uh, I also want to thank again all the folks that were responsible for actually creating the system. I get to be the salesman and the showman up here, and that's the easy part of the job. So uh, to Sherwin, TK, Nick, uh, all the guys that helped to make this possible, um, they deserve all the credit. So thank you. the existing library of Penn State badges available across the system to even the campuses to start to just play with existing badges versus creating our own? Yes, yes it is. So there is a, uh, one of the concepts I didn't talk about that's available in the system, uh, and it gets a little jargony, but we call it a meta badge. 
This is a, it's a badge that uses existing badges as its criteria. One of the things that we thought would be interesting in letting people do is, so I, I assume, presume you're from a campus yeah. location, so uh, you might look into the system and say, hey, I really like this badge that was created by someone else. I like that and I also want to create my own. So I'm going to create this one big badge that uses someone else's badge and also includes one of that I have made. Uh, and so it lets you sort of take the best of existing systems. We hope long term that it will help to reduce redundancy, right? Because it means that the same person doesn't need to create the exact same thing all over the place. It does raise some interesting questions about scale. So if you and 500 of your colleagues all see this one badge that was created for a class of 30 uh, at a different location, all of a sudden now that assessor is getting flooded with a lot more uh, reviews than they were expecting to have to do. Um, but we hope that's the kind of problem that we want to create, right? We want the best opportunities for learning to start to rise to the top. Uh, we want people to talk with each other about the kinds of content they're using and, and find efficiencies in that way. But to answer your question, yes, uh, you can look in the system, see every badge that's there, try it out, use it, submit it on your own, um, and I'd be happy to set it, be open to an account if you're interested in that. One light question, one heavier. Uh, right. Lighter first. Do you have any good examples you could share of badges that have already kind of gained popularity in any type of context? And then number two is, can you elaborate on any interest at the highest level on monetizing badges from a credential standpoint? And if so, mm -hmm. how far away do you think that is here at Penn State? Yeah. All right, we'll start with the tough question. Um, it, so yes, uh, there is interest in different ways, and, and I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know what the timeline is, but one of the examples that comes up quite a bit is, um, so the, the dean of the College of IST, once we were having a conversation about badges, and he viewed this as an opportunity to provide uh, sort of outreach to alumni, right? So you graduated with a technology degree in 2000. Well, since then, a lot's changed, and maybe the curriculum here at Penn State's changed, and so that course you took on databases 12, 14 years ago, it's not quite as up to date as it could be. Maybe we might offer you a small course and a badge, uh, and maybe it's free if you keep your alumni association dues paid. Maybe it costs $50, some small amount of money, right? So there are ways that could potentially uh, keep people engaged. Maybe it costs nothing. I don't know necessarily what that looks like. But I think that's one of the most compelling use cases is to, uh, one, reach out to alumni, and also this idea of reaching out to people who uh, view the degree as being too burdensome. So either it takes too much time or it costs too much money to get a four-year degree. Well, why not offer badges to those people that can provide something, not quite an associate's, more than a certificate that can help them to uh, get promoted, find employment, suit whatever goals they might have. Um, in terms of the badges that we think are, are kind of the most popular right now, so there's a couple um, that, so in pilot it's a difficult question to answer that. But there are, I guess, three that I'll point to um, with caveats to a lot more. So what the university library is doing uh, has a huge scope to it. So they teach ultimately every freshman that comes into the university. What, you know, the popularity of it, you know, it may not be the most exciting badge, but it's very, very useful. And in talking with uh, employers, as our colleague has done, uh, it's one of those things that digital literacy skills is not articulated in most ways, so there's a lot of excitement about that. There is a leadership credential that the Office of Student Affairs and Career Services are sort of jointly building. Uh, again, to recognize something that's not traditionally a part of what we recognize uh, as a university. Um, and then there are several academic departments that are interested in using badges in different ways. Uh, we could talk more, I guess, after the session, but those, I would say, are probably the, the most prominent, but Office of Sustainability, uh, the professional development opportunities for badges. There's, so there's a lot of different use cases that are compelling for different ways, I guess. Sure. Uh, you just brought up the, the issue of the, the old database course that was taken a dozen years ago, but yeah. um, what sort of thought have you given to the fact that badges may um, naturally degrade over time as yeah as the curriculum changes, as knowledge increases? Yeah, so there's a, that's a great question. And one of the things, it, so this was, a similar idea was brought up, we have a training group uh, here at Penn State that will help teach people 
uh, a whole range of different things, but specifically software skills, right? So you want to get certified in uh, Excel 2014. That is something that can sort of self-deprecate at a point because Excel 2020, so Excel 2015 comes out, whatever it is. Um, CPR training, right, is another kind of example that comes up a lot. There are skills that lapse over time. And so we have talked about the idea of expiry, uh, expiring uh, badges that sort of, at so long after you've earned them, they will essentially disappear or maybe they get a visual indicator. That's not something that's a currently a part of the system, but it is part of our future plans uh, because that case comes up a lot more than I think people would think it does. Uh, and it's really important to show that you still earned this. So you will always get credit for that database course in 2000, but we might recommend that you come back and, and try and refresh that a little bit. So great point. Thanks. Um, this is really fantastic, so thank you. I want to thank you for sharing this presentation. Thank I have you. two questions, and they're both kind of big, um, and they <laughs> okay. might fall under that category of stuff that you're still thinking through. But one, I was wondering, I know Penn State has a Coursera presence, right? Yeah. Um, has there been discussion about how will things like this align with or don't align with Coursera's credentialing ideas around signature right. track and stuff? Um, and then secondly, it seems like you're creating a, a digital repository of student work kind yeah. of accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> is this, does it feel like that to you? And how are you thinking through all of that um, saving of the student uh, work product in addition to credentialing them? Yeah. So my parent organization also is, is heavily involved in the Coursera relationship. Um, and so those conversations are happening. They have not fully been fleshed out, though. Uh, I guess only recently Coursera has uh, announced a partnership with LinkedIn that they will be badging almost the kinds of things if you do. So if you earn that certificate from a Coursera course, you can export it into something like LinkedIn. Um, whether or not we end up plugging into that, whether or not we create our own version of that, I guess is yet to be determined. We are thinking about it, but I, unfortunately I don't have a lot more answers than that. In terms of the, the long-term data storage, terrifying prospect. Um, and it is, it is thankfully, I think, something that is far above my pay grade to answer uh, that question because we don't, even within our CMS system, we don't preserve student work forever. We don't preserve student access accounts forever. So even just your user ID, uh, you know, you lose access to Penn State stuff, I think six months after you graduate. Um, so there, you know, we do provide what we call Friends of Penn State accounts, which are long-term accounts that are basically for email, they're not data storage. So what this will look like uh, is terrifying, but very, very important, um, I think. And so again, I don't fully have answers uh, to all the questions, but that, those questions are, are being asked right now uh, with the people who have the authority to decide on those sort of things, so. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns? All right. Well, thank you guys very much for your time. I very much appreciate it. So enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, thank you very much. Appreciate it.